Debating against the motion, we have uh, with us uh, uh, speaking. I would like to start with the year 1977, 20 years after we gained our independence as a nation state. That year, a justice of the federal court pronounced a judgment which would breathe life along with the true spirit of Merdeka unto the federal constitution. The judge, who would later become the chief justice of the country and would also pen countless judgments, some to be landmark decisions, is none other than the late Sultan Azlan Shah, the father of the current uh, ruling Sultan of Perak. In his judgment, in the case of Loh Kui Chun, his lordship made it very clear that our federal constitution stood in its own right and that the principles and interpretations must be based on our own principles and traditions. If I may quote what he said in the judgment, our constitution now stand in its own right and it is in the end the wording of our constitution itself that is to be interpreted and applied. And this wording can never be overridden by the extraneous principles of the other constitutions. This short paragraph marked an important, uh, an important point in the history of our nation because it awesomely destroyed the oft-repeated myth that the federal constitution as, as the highest law of the federation and all the other legislations made thereunder purportedly must be interpreted within the principles that were supposedly inherited from the British legal system or that were supposedly secular in their framework or that even worse still that we are supposedly condemned for eternity to be tied to this colonial to these shackles of the colonial legal system this coming august would mark the 60th year of our independence 54 since we were known as malaysia and the judgment of the late royal highness in that case some 44, 40 years ago, set the record straight that the meaning of independence covers not only political or physical freedom in the very superficial sense, but rather it set the record straight, it declared that our legal narratives are now freed for, from the shackles of the colonial ideologies. We are to set our own jurisprudence based from our own local context from the wellsprings of our own tradition as opposed to merely mimic some foreign legal principle. Thus, it is within this context that the position of Islam under the federal constitution, Article 3, clearly that we must give effect to this provision, to the full and true meaning. And I believe you all read during our school days, we read history, that during the formation process of our nation, the Red Commission was tasked to look into the inherent pluralities within the society of Malaya during that time. And after having received and considered more than 100 memorandums, this is what the Red Commission recommended, that the Qadi court, because during that time, the term Sharia court was yet to be used. So they refer it to Qadi's court or Muslim court, the Qadi's court are there to stay. As have been explained by my learned friend, uh, Lukman Sharif just now, that the constitution expressly provides for the Sharia courts to actually punish offenses with regards to the Sharia, to try offenses with regard to Sharia. This is clearly provided for under the ninth schedule. So based on this, it is based on this that the RUU 355 comes into the picture. It was first passed in the year 1965. The offense, the punishment, the jurisdiction then was very minimal. It was 1,000 fine and also uh, six months imprisonment. And then in 1984, it was increased to as it is now. Now, after 33 years, I am 33 years, 
I was born in 1984. After 33 years, the jurisdiction was there. It remains at that level, never changed. While the civil court jurisdiction has been changed and improved many, many times. A couple of years ago, uh, in 2012, the jurisdiction of the civil court, magistrate and sessions court, was actually increased. Nobody ever made remark on that. Nobody ever objected to that. But when it was with regards to the Sharia court, suddenly there was an uproar. Why is this so? Why is it? So it, it is sad, but there seems to be a concerted attempt by certain quarters to undermine and tarnish the image of the Islamic legal system in Malaysia. Whenever there is a mention of Islam, Sharia is a big no-no. Hudud is the punching bag, the political punching bag. Just last year, by uh, an individual by the name of Pial Khadila Abdullah, I just want to give an example about this fear mongering. The, the, uh, Pial Khadila Abdullah I don't know, maybe some of you might, might have, uh, have heard of her. She lamented on her Facebook page, and this became viral instantly. It was shared thousands of times, and it was picked up by portals. And what she wrote, if I can just read what she wrote. Uh, I am completely fed up, disappointed, heartbroken, and fr with a frustrating system. She is referring to the Sharia court. I have filed for divorce six years ago, six years ago, all caps. And on the 23rd of May, 2016, I finally got my divorce. When the judge read out the decision, I was, I was so unbelievably happy. It was the sweetest, the most powerful words ever. Then, after 14 days, the man appeals against the judge's decision, and here I am again in the land of nowhere. The divorce hangs and awaits for the appeal process that till today the appeal department doesn't even know if they've received the appeal statement. But the courts can't release my divorce letters because an appeal has been made. How long more? How long more, Malaysian Sharia courts? Six years of my life and now I have to wait again. For how long? When will the Sharia courts and everyone who has a hand to do something will ever do something? Perhaps if I killed myself, the only then only will it spark some attention. I will speak up for as long as I live that, that what's happening right now is a, simp is a living example of how women in the history is being left in the country, is being left hopeless and disempowered by the Sharia family courts. No one can force me to be with someone I don't want to be with anymore. So she put the whole blame to the Sharia court. But guess what? It is not even true because Several days later, after the post has been so viral, because I remember when I read her story, I felt so angry to those people in the Sharia court. But then several days, days later, Sahabat Makamah Sharia posted a reply and put the record straight that the six years actually was not because of the incompetency of the Sharia court system, but was due to the incompetent conduct of the parties, of Pial Khadila herself. What happened was that, that three, there was three petitions filed. The first petition filed by Pial Khadila was struck out by the judge. Why? Because she herself failed to attend court. It, is her, it was her petition and she failed to attend court. And how dare her to put the blame to the Sharia court. And this is what is happening right now. And then the second one, it was filed only to be withdrawn yet again by Pial Khadila. Please, please respect, please respect the speaker. I hope please, I can, I do, go ahead. I hope I can have more time because of yes, that. Yes, <laughs> City, please, please respect the speaker. And then when she filed her petition the third time, when all the cost papers are in order, when there are no errors by the parties, it took only 10 months for the judge to actually decide the, for the divorce. So this kind of things, putting the blame on the Sharia court, has to stop somewhere. We, uh, please respect the speaker. Yeah, I yeah? think that's what she is bothering me now. Okay, please leave me alone. 
It's ideal. Please proceed. Sorry about that. We read about the wave of, of Islamophobia in the United States, but actually, in our own backyards, there are those who tirelessly spew hatred towards Islam and the system of Islamic law by telling lies and half-truths to, to paint a bad image, just like Hadila. Just several weeks ago, a member of parliament from the AP, Teresa Kok, shared on her Facebook page a news report about an Indonesian Buddhist uh, who was punished, who was caned under the Sharia law in Aceh, because Aceh has a Sharia system. This is to paint an, ima uh, an image, this is to, to substantiate her claim that when, if in Malaysia we have Sharia law, then it will, in, at the end of the day, still affect the non-Muslims. But what she omitted to tell is that the, actually the Indonesian Buddhist was caught for illegal gambling, which, by the way, in Malaysia, we don't talk about the Sharia law. Even under the civil law, the cr civil criminal law, it is a crime. Don't talk about the Sharia law. So this guy was caught for illegal gambling there, and he was given a choice whether to be punished under Jinayat, the Sharia law there, or under the general criminal law, which is applicable to the non-Muslims. And he opted for the Sharia. Why? Because it is more compassionate. Rather than going to the, uh, uh, for, rather than getting jail term, he would just have to uh, be caned. So how can a, a non-Muslim freely opted to be punished under the Sharia be given as an example that if we apply it in Malaysia, then it would, it would also affect the non-Muslims. So my point here is simply this, that we should stop this, this uh, fear-mongering among the non-Muslims, that Sharia, that Islam, whatever to do with the Muslim, and whatever is bad, we have to stop this. This, the position of Islam is so clearly enshrined under the federal constitution. Before I conclude, I just want to say this. The problem confronting our nation today, and it is a profound problem, is that we have people, educated people, learned people, and lawyers not least, that fail to appreciate or deliberately attempting to deny the identity and the roots of this nation, clinging instead to the colonial mentality and ideologies, shutting any doors that would open, that would open up to our rich traditions, along with the role of religion in all their beauty and exuberance to be given more prominent roles. They odiously militate against locally developed jurisprudence and principles, preferring instead foreign and alien concepts of perverse ideologies. Let us be clear. Islam is very much embedded, not only within the psyche of the people, but also within the constitutional frame, framework. In the year 2012, our court has declared loud and clear in the case of titular Roman Catholic Archbishop, the famous Kalimah Allah case. And I would like to read what the bench said. I would, this uh, quote, I would add, however, that the position of Islam as the religion of the Federation, to my mind, imposes certain obligation on the power that be to promote and defend Islam, as well as to protect its sanctity. In one article written by Muhammad Imam entitled Freedom of Religion under the Federal Constitution, a reappraisal, <laughs> referred to by the Learned Council for the Eighth Appellant, it was said that Article 3 is not a mere declaration, but it imposes positive obligation on the Federation to protect, defend, promote Islam, and to give effect by appropriate state action to the injunction of Islam and able to facilitate and encourage people to hold their life according to the Islamic injunction, spiritual and daily life. Thus, it is based upon such positive constitutional obligation, because the judge used this term, positive obligation on the, on the powers that be, that this RUU 355 to enhance the power the Sharia, of the Sharia court with increased jurisdiction ought to be supported. Thank you. Um, 1984, when the 355 
Act was amended. I was then in England and so could not oppose the amendment. I'm here now, so I will certainly oppose this. In, in opposing RUU 355, I would like to first quote this eminent passage from Professor Abdullah Ahmad An Naim from his book entitled Islam and the Secular State Negotiating the Future of Sharia. I quote In order to be a Muslim by conviction, and free choice, which is the only way one can be a Muslim, I need a secular state. By a secular state, I mean one that is neutral regarding religious doctrine, one that does not claim or pretend to enforce Sharia, simply because compliance with Sharia cannot be coerced by fear of state institutions, or faked to appease the officials. Now, my learned friend referred to the decision in 1977, Law Kui, Law Kui Chun, yes. Uh, that's a very famous decision by the late Justice Raja Aslan Shah. I would like to take you 10 years later to a very, very important decision by then Lord President Tun Saleh Abbas in the case of Che Omar Che So. Now, this was a rather ingenious argument by a friend, Ramdas Tikamdas, who was defending someone under the Dangerous Drugs Act. Would that be right? Uh, yes. And uh, the chap was facing the gallows. He was going to be hanged. So this was the final appeal, and Ramdas comes up with this brilliant idea. Article 3, Islam is the religion of the Federation, and therefore, there is no hanging for drugs in Sharia, Therefore, this provision violates the Constitution. Okay? Very clever argument. It went before a five-man panel. And this is very important. It's a five-man quorum of the highest court. And this is what Tun Saleh. This is what Tun Saleh says in relation to that argument. He says, it can be seen that during the British colonial period, through the system of indirect rule and establishment of secular institutions, Islamic law was rendered isolated in a narrow confinement of the law of marriage, divorce, and inheritance only. In our view, it is in this sense that the framers of the Constitution understood the meaning of the word Islam in the context of Article 3. If it had been otherwise, there would have been another provision in the Constitution which would have the effect that any law contrary to the injunction of Islam will be void. Far from making such a provision, Article 162, on the other hand, now this is important, purposely preserves the continuity of secular law prior to the Constitution, unless such law is contrary to the latter. Now, his lordship then says this. This is so important. We have to set aside our personal feelings, because the law in this country is still what it is today, secular law. Now, to this day, as far as I can recall, this decision has never been overruled. It is still the law of the land. Now, for those who still insist that, well, Saleh Abbas got it wrong, the Reed Commission report, which is the precursor to the Constitution, says this in relation to Article 3. We have considered the question whether there should be any statement in the Constitution to the effect that Islam should be the state religion. There was universal agreement that if any such provision were inserted, it must be made clear that it would, it would not in any way affect the civil rights of non-Muslims. In the memorandum submitted by the Alliance, it was stated, the religion of Malaysia shall be Islam. This is important. The observance of this principle shall not impose any disability on non-Muslim nationals professing and practicing their own religions and shall not imply that the state is not a secular state. 
for the avoidance of all doubt, 1983, during the celebration of his 80th birthday, Tengku Abdul Rahman, who was privy to the negotiations with the British in the run-up to the culmination of the federal constitution, said this, we are a multiracial country with a diversity of religions. We must continue to be a secular state. Okay, now he was privy to the negotiations. So on that footing, I oppose RUU355 because in the larger scheme of things, what I have observed over the last 30 years is a gradual whittling away of this secular state. One, by individuals, men and women, holding high office who have taken oath to uphold, defend and preserve the constitution. And two, um, by laws passed by state legislature, purportedly, purportedly pursuant to powers under the nine schedule, second list item one. Now I want to go there because it was mentioned that there is power to, con to create offenses, yes, yes. But the language in that provision is this, the power to create and punish offenses against the precepts of Islam. The language is very precise. Now, against the precepts of Islam can be somewhat ambiguous. What are precepts? We can go on debating about this all day. But I want to share with you three offenses that are in the Vilaya Persekutuan 1997 Act. And I will contend that these are not against precepts of Islam. This is from the Sharia Criminal Offences Federal Territories Act of 1997. Section 12. Any person who gives, propagates, or disseminates any opinion concerning Islamic teachings, Islamic law, or any issue contrary to any fatwa, for the time being in force, in the federal territories shall be guilty of an offense and shall on conviction be liable to a fine not exceeding 3,000 ringgit or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years or to both. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have read the, the book Risala, uh, Imam al-Shafi'i, and you will find that in those days there were arguments and counter-arguments going back and forth, and there were differing opinions. And that appeared to be the order of the day. But what this law effectively says, that if a Muslim holds an opinion contrary to a fatwa, and remember this, a fatwa is not the edict of God. It is another man. And I can tell you, the, fat the fatwa committee has heard at least once in 1984 in relation to the Shia mazhab that was halal and 12 years later saying, no, it's haram. So they err. Now, this offense effectively says, if you're a Muslim, you're not entitled to have an opinion contrary. In short, don't think. <laughs> I'm not prepared to bow to that. Section 14. Any male person being balik who fails to perform the Friday prayers in a mosque within his career for three consecutive weeks without uzur shari'i or without any reasonable cause shall be guilty of an offense and shall on conviction be liable to a fine not exceeding 1,000 ringgit or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding six months or to both. Excuse me, my prayer is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to nobody else. And it's nobody else's business if for any reason I do not or cannot. And to have a law that says it is the business of the state. It's not something that I think can be countenanced in the Islam that I have come to understand. Section 15. Any person who during the hours of fasting in the month of Ramadan, B, openly or in a public place is found to be eating, drinking or smoking, shall be guilty of an offense and shall on conviction be liable to a fine not exceeding 1,000 ringgit or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding six months or to both, and for a second or subsequent offense to a fine not exceeding 2,000 ringgit or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding one year or to both. 
correct me if, I, if I'm mistaken because I'm not a Muslim scholar, but I try to understand my, my, my religion. In the Quran, Allah allows during the fasting month for one who is ill or who's on a journey to defer the fast. If I'm mistaken, please correct me. Now, how if I'm traveling from Trenganu to KL and I want to partake of food, am I to hide in the toilet and eat? When Allah has given me permission to defer it, the law says I cannot eat publicly. Now, I have to ask this question. It is the congregational prayer that you miss three, con three weeks consecutively that's an offense. It's the offense of eating in public. What is being promoted here? Rank hypocrisy, eat but hide. If you, if you, miss, the, if you miss your 35 salat a week, that's okay, but if you miss the congregational prayer, it's an offense. What are we advocating? My, my point is simply this. I do not see these offenses in Islam. The Quran and the Islam that I've come to understand, I find, yes, there are mentions of punishment in three offenses that I can note. But the Quran is replete with verses that enjoin us to forgive, to forgive, to forgive, and to forgive. And the Islam that I've come to understand is one that enjoins on its adherents, its believers, to enjoy goodwill with their fellow human beings, to love, be compassionate, be tender, and to respect. Um, that is the Islam that I see. I am not prepared to have that taken from me by people who claim to have authority just because I said, Ashadu a la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, that does not give license to somebody else to now decree to me my tenets of my faith. I will not countenance that. Now, it was suggested, it was suggested that these provisions do not impact on non-Muslims. With the greatest of respect, look at the tapestry over the last 30 years. In 1988, Jamaluddin Osman renounced Islam, became a Christian, was detained under the ISA. The case went to the High Court and then went to the Supreme Court. Guess what? Nobody questioned his right to renounce Islam. It was a given. Ten years later, 1988, 1999, 1998 and 1999, the IC department had regulations changed that now required the ICs of Muslims to have the word Islam. It's a regulatory change. Not, substan not substantive law. Lina Joy was refused her right to have that removed. And in the federal court, they told her, a non-Muslim now, you need to go to the Sharia court to get an exit order. The written law had not changed. The substantive written law had not changed from the time of Jamaluddin Osman to Lina Joy. What had changed? Personages sitting in high office who decided that they would take us on an Islamization process. I call it Islam as I say shun process because it is as I say and as I do, so you shall. Yes. Now, um, you talk about the Allah issue. That was never an issue. If, if, if my learned friend contends that since the 15th century, this has been the practice, the practice of the Christians in, in, in uh, East Malaysia using Allah in their baptism probably is for the same period of time. But why are they being deprived, deprived now of their cultural heritage? Uh, you talk about the um, body snatching, body snatching cases. The case, in, uh, the case of um, the Mount Everest climber in December 2005. Previous to this, civil courts would decide. What happened in that case was Justice Rao Sharif in the High Court refused to adjudicate on the matter because the Sharia court had decided that he had died a Muslim. Go back to the written law that confers jurisdiction on the Sharia court, nothing of that sort was ever given to the Sharia court. So what you see is an abdication of duty on the part of certain individuals to expand the scope of the Sharia court. And this, my, my friends, if you continue to say, and as my learned friend says, will not impact on the non-Muslims, please wake up. All right, it's been happening, it's been happening, and it's been happening. To me, RU355, is a continuation of that Islam association process. I think it's about time we said no. I'm saying no. Thank you.